Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Right, hello everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce Archontis Politis, who's been working with me for the past two weeks, 12, uh, two week, 12 weeks. It's shot by. Um, uh, Arcontis joins us from Alto University in Finland, where he works with problems on spatial audio capture and reproduction as part of his PhD work. Um, and it seemed only natural that we should give him an image processing problem to be working with here. Um, so without any further ado, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, so yeah, I will jump straight into the uh, presentation and what was my task here uh, for this internship. Uh, so uh, I was working on an audio and acoustics problem uh, through a kind of a graphics problem route. And that was quite interesting because I haven't done stuff like that uh, before in a way. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the talk of the presentation is applications of 3D spherical transforms to acoustics and personalization of uh, head-related transfer functions. Uh, so before I, I go to the uh, actual task and the method that we used, I will speak a little bit about the motivation, what uh, got us into the, uh, to, to, to do what we finally um, uh, used. And, uh, the, the motivation for this work was uh, HRDF personalization. So uh, HRDFs or head related transfer functions uh, are filters that um, they are direction dependent and uh, they model the acoustical response from a sound source to the listener's uh, ears. So basically they are the transfer functions uh, for uh, a source at some uh, distance uh, from the listener uh, to, to the eardrums of the listener. And these are crucial for high quality spatial sound reproduction over headphones uh, since, um, uh, uh, since uh, if we convolve a set of uh, these filters for a certain direction with, uh, for example, uh, a monophonic recording, we can create the sensation that the sound is coming from that specific direction. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one uh, uh, property of these uh, filters is, is that they are uh, quite much individualized. So uh, we have to measure them for uh, a certain individual and uh, this individual's uh, set of HRTFs, they encode important uh, spatial cues, mainly um, uh, cues that having to do with uh, elevation, but also with uh, uh, azimuth of a uh, sound source. And uh, this creates a problem because uh, it means that ideally we have to measure a set of HRDFs for each specific individual that we want to deploy uh, an immersive uh, application that uses uh, full spatial sound over headphones. And measurement of HRDFs is a very lengthy uh, and costly process. You have to build uh, uh, a room, an anechoic space, like uh, these uh, ones in the photo. And uh, you also need uh, some special uh, apparatus uh, that is uh, specifically designed for the task of measuring HRTFs around the listener. This is an example of the uh, anechoic space uh, here at uh, Microsoft Research and the apparatus with a rotating arc that measures the HRTFs around the head of the listener that sits in the middle. And uh, the lower picture, I think it's some uh, older uh, set up in um, either NASA or uh, some Air Force facility that they have uh, a full grid of uh, loudspeakers and the listener has to get inside uh, that grid. Uh, so this is not really an option for general deployment of immersive uh, audiovisual applications. Uh, so the way the research uh, world has treated this problem is um, uh, there are two or three different uh, approaches. Um, <clears throat> one of them uh, is, uh, uh, one of the things people have proposed is uh, that uh, you, you somehow model the HRDFs as a set of filters 
with a few parameters and then uh, you present the task to the user that they can tune these parameters in order to make these HRTFs kind of match what they would like to, to hear or use or match their own. Uh, the second approach is um, an approach based on uh, numerical simulation. So you get some kind of uh, rough model of the head and the ears, and then uh, you put it in an acoustic uh, simulator uh, on a computer, and uh, you try to model the scattering effect that the head has on a sound or sound wave uh, up to the I don't know up to 20 kilohertz, up to the audible frequency range. And uh, this is also a quite nice solution. Uh, the problem is that it's uh, also extremely lengthy. It uh, normally, for most uh, numerical simulation methods, it will take uh, days to, to compute the full free audible frequency range. Uh, the third approach, and the one that relates mostly to what uh, we are doing, is uh, to measure a database of HRTFs for many subjects and then try to find uh, for a, a specific user uh, the one that would match him well based on, uh, on some features of him, uh, some morphological features mostly. And uh, so what people have done is that they have measured um, um, uh, tens or hundreds of subjects and they have kept uh, a directory of um, anthropometric features and then uh, <coughs> Uh, they have uh, tried to, um, uh, and then they, for a, a, any new user, uh, all they need to do is measure their own uh, anthropometric features, find the ones in the database that they are closer to the users, and then pick this HRTF or kind of uh, a set of HRTFs, uh, hoping that this would match the user quite well. And. Uh, the problem with this approach up till now is that um, there is no direct connection between an HRTF uh, or at least a very clear direct connection between an HRTF and all these specific anthropometric features. Uh, it's very hard and it's still unclear and an open problem how, for example, uh, these individual features affect specific uh, features in the HRTF uh, response. So, even though this approach has been studied quite a lot, um, it's uh, still an open problem and many times the relations, the relations that have been used are quite arbitrary. <coughs> uh, so the main motivation of this research was, uh, first we know that the HRTFs clearly depend on uh, the head shape and the head size uh, on some way. Uh, since basically uh, they model the scattering of the sound around the head. And uh, the, wha what, what we were thinking was that if we can determine a similarity measure between uh, heads in a database that uh, is based directly on the total head shape rather than individual features. And uh, <coughs> the way we approach this problem uh, was to uh, see it as a three-dimensional shape or a surface or distribution and uh, perform a spectral or harmonic decomposition on the head shape. So kind of uh, try to find uh, spatial frequency components that they model this head shape in some way and uh, try to determine similarity based on these um, uh, spatial frequency uh, components. Uh, so the first uh, step uh, towards that was to consider uh, one quite popular spatial transform. Uh, popular in many fields, also in acoustics, uh, since it's you, it has been used in uh, many acoustic applications. And that's a spherical harmonic transform, which uh, basically, uh, it's like a two-dimensional Fourier transform on, uh, for data or functions defined on the unit sphere. And uh, that has been used in acoustics for uh, modeling of uh, radi loudspeaker radiation patterns, uh, uh, microphone uh, directivity patterns, also for spherical array beamforming and spatial filtering, uh, which is um, uh, very, it's a, a very active field of research uh, the last decades. Um, also for immersive 3D sound recording and reproduction, uh, with a family of methods that have been uh, popularized as ambisonics. And uh, finally, 
for interpolation of HRTFs. Since HRTFs are measured around the listener on a spherical grid, uh, the spherical harmonic transform is a pretty natural way to uh, first compress all this uh, data and also uh, use the inverse transform to interpolate between the measurement points. So that's a, uh, that's a look on um, uh, a little bit of the maths of the spherical harmonic transform. Um, so uh, we get the spherical harmonic coefficients by projecting our function onto the uh, basis, spherical harmonic basis functions, which are also called spherical harmonics. And these spherical harmonics have a dependency on the azimuth and the elevation uh, with a normalization term that keeps them uh, orthonormal over integration over the unit sphere. And then uh, using these coefficients, that, uh, these uh, harmonic coefficients, we can reconstruct the, our um, uh, uh, function or uh, interpolate our data for any direction that we want. And uh, the domain of the function is the unit sphere, so it depends on azimuth and elevation. Uh, and uh, even though uh, theoretically the transform should be infinite, for uh, most practical uh, functions, especially in acoustics, uh, this uh, summation can be described uh, perfectly well with a finite sum. So actually the transform is practical. An example of uh, the use of the spherical harmonic transform is, uh, uh, for example, in uh, HRDF interpolation, as I mentioned. Uh, so this is uh, HRDF magnitudes for uh, the left ear of a user measured here in MSR at uh, one kilohertz. And uh, this grid of points is actually the measurement grid. And uh, we can see uh, this, uh, yeah, the magnitude variation across different directions. Uh, and if we, if we perform a spherical harmonic transform on this data, we get the spherical harmonic spectra. And uh, using the spectra, by performing the inverse transform, we get a very nice smooth surface at any direction we want that models very well uh, this um, HRTF uh, directivity function. Since the title of the graph is L equals 15, what does oh, that mean, I guess? Oh yeah, that's actually the order of uh, the transform, meaning that um, uh, we use more and more harmonic components uh, to capture um, uh, well the, uh, the variation across angles uh, of the function. And uh, this order is determined um, by a few factors. First of all, uh, is determined by how uh, smooth our uh, original, let's say, uh, HRTF is across different directions, but also it's limited by how many measurements we have done, so by a kind of a sampling condition. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the order of the transform was 15, which actually means it used 256 coefficients. So basically, with the 256 coefficients, we could interpolate for any direction we wanted for this single frequency. Um, so yeah, that's also a quick example of um, uh, how these basis functions look like, the spherical harmonics. And uh, we can see that kind of uh, they get, they have more angular variation at increasing orders and also different uh, basis functions, different spherical harmonics have different symmetry properties, meaning that uh, they can capture different kind of um, uh, properties of the shape or the distribution that uh, we are uh, transforming. <coughs> so of special interest to our work uh, here was the fact that uh, the spherical harmonic transform is also quite popular in the graphics community. It's used mainly for uh, tasks that have to do with uh, lightning of 3D objects and uh, rendering. But uh, it has also been used for, um, uh, for example, approximation of, uh, uh, fast approximation of uh, 3D heads. Um, so this is an example of um, a 3D mesh uh, captured uh, with the laser scanning. And this is what the spherical harmonic transform uh, 
uh, gives with uh, an order of 25 and 676 coefficients. So you can see that it captures most features of the head uh, in a smooth representation and uh, the same for the other head too. Uh, one thing we can note here is that uh, very complex surfaces, for example, like the back of the ear, cannot really be captured by a transform like that. Uh, because it's a two-dimensional transform, it can only detect the furthest points uh, on the surface of the head, uh, and it cannot model variations with uh, across uh, radial variations like that. And uh, of even more interest to, uh, to our work in this internship uh, was the fact that um, the spherical harmonic transform has been used also in the problem, again from the graphics community, in the problem of uh, trying to detect similar 3D objects in a 3D model database. Uh, so uh, if we have a database of uh, thousands of 3D models and we do a query uh, with a new 3D model, uh, the problem is to try to find similar models in the database. And uh, as I mentioned, the spherical harmonic transform as it is, it has this limitation that uh, it cannot capture radial variations. So it's not by itself suited for this problem very well for complex 3D shapes. Uh, essentially, it, it requires that every, if the origin is the inside of the 3D model, it requires that every point of the 3D model is visible from the origin. So they, there are no occlusions or uh, stuff like that. Uh, so the way the uh, people used it before for this similarity problem is that uh, they took the 3D model, uh, then they created concentric spheres that uh, they were growing outwards from the center of the object, and then they were taking the they were taking the intersection of these concentric spheres with a 3D model, and they were applying the spherical harmonic transform uh, for these spheres separately. What and then they were ending with a two-dimensional uh, matrix of uh, spherical harmonic uh, coefficients, which was then used as a template to find the similarity between the 3D models. Uh, one uh, other nice detail about uh, this study and similar studies is that uh, it makes sense for this kind of problem not to use directly the spherical harmonic coefficients, but actually to use uh, the energy of uh, certain, the energy of the coefficients uh, for each order L, which has the the important property that it doesn't depend on a rotation of the object. Uh, so uh, if instead of directly the coefficients we use the spectral energies, uh, we end up with a smaller vector and that vector doesn't change if the object is rotated or not. And that's a very nice property for this similarity matching problem. <coughs> so finally, um, we saw that the spherical harmonic transform can be quite good for uh, our task, which relates also to this HRTF personalization task. Uh, however, it's, uh, the, the, the way the people used it before uh, is a bit ad hoc. It's uh, in a way somewhere between a spatial transform uh, and uh, somewhere between a, a spatial representation and a harmonic representation. Uh, it, it breaks down the object in these uh, spheres and then you have uh, a harmonic representation for each one of these spheres. Uh, what we thought is that um, we can go one step further and use a full three-dimensional transform. So instead of only capturing the angular variation across each one of these spheres, uh, we can also try to capture the radial variation, and then we end up with a full three-dimensional transform uh, that models both angular uh, and radial frequency components. Uh, so we focused on uh, two 3D spherical transforms. Uh, one is the spherical Fourier-Bessel transform, uh, which is um, uh, which has been used quite much in uh, physics and chemistry, and I think uh, also in some image processing problems. And uh, the second one is the spherical harmonic oscillator transform. Uh, which is not very popular by this name. Uh, there are only a few works that mention it like that. Uh, but I think it has been used quite much in uh, like uh, qu quantum physics uh, or quantum engineering. 
So the first one, the spherical Fourier Bessel transform. Uh, just a few notes here. Uh, first of all, this transform is not any more defined like the spherical harmonic transform only on the surface of a sphere, but uh, is defined. Uh, it, it has also it is defined on the 3D space. It has also the radial component, and uh, here the domain of integration is uh, a solid sphere uh, rise, uh, going from zero up to some uh, radius that we want, and basically. It encloses completely our shape, and uh, this uh, do, this radius of the domain uh, determines uh, many properties of the wave functions, like uh, the scaling of the radial functions and uh, the normalization term. And we can also see that uh, the basis functions for this for this transform uh, contain basically the spherical harmonics. Uh, so the angular components are still captured by the spherical harmonics while the radial component is captured by the spherical Bessel functions. Uh, this is an example of how the basis functions look like. Uh, this is not very clear, but what we can say at least is that uh, this is a specific wave function. And uh, apart from the angular variation, it's now a full, full three-dimensional uh, function. So it's defined in uh, the full 3D space. And we can see at least here that it has variation both across the angular uh, dimension and across the radial dimension. The second transform is uh, the spherical harmonic oscillator transform. Uh, similar to the spherical Fourier Bessel transform, uh, it's uh, also uh, three dimensional. The difference with the spherical Fourier Bessel is that uh, for the radial component, it uses this uh, associated Laguerre polynomials. And uh, now the domain of integration is not a solid sphere, but it goes from zero to infinity. Uh, however, the transform is still suitable to capture and model uh, shapes that are concentrated at some region. Uh, Again, that's a picture of uh, an example of uh, the harmonic oscillator transform basis functions. And uh, next, after we implemented the basic form of these uh, transforms, uh, we had to determine, um, we, we had to, 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 to think of what we could use them for. And uh, naturally, uh, one, uh, one good application is uh, compression interpolation, not only of data on a sphere, but uh, data on, uh, uh, on the 3D space, uh, especially data that are sampled uh, spherically are very well suited for these transforms. And uh, a natural application for that can be the 3D interpolation of uh, near-field HRTFs. Uh, Near-field HRDFs uh, refer to the fact that um, even though HRDFs are known to be, uh, not to change apart from a scaling factor for uh, source distances beyond uh, one to one and a half meter, uh, that fact doesn't hold true for uh, close distances to the head. Uh, so if we want to make a sound appear like it's coming really close to the head, we have actually to measure HRDFs at different distances from the head. Uh, so we have a radial variation, and um, uh, this is something that can be compressed and also uh, expressed by use of the full 3D transforms. And also, after we have gotten the harmonic coefficients, it's very easy and fast to interpolate at any point we want. The second task, and it is, and it is the task that motivated uh, this research, is uh, that uh, we can use these 3D transforms to capture the harmonic components of head shapes, uh, get, for example, uh, uh, get quickly a 3D scan of a user by using, for example, the Kinect, and then uh, by, by use of the Fourier Bessel transform or the SHOT, uh, we can get the harmonic components or the spectrum of the user's head, and then comparing compare it with the spectra of uh, uh, the heads in a database that we have also measured the HRTFs, and then just pull the HRTF that corresponds to the closest head to the user. Uh, 
And as I mentioned before, uh, a nice property of the three-dimensional transforms similar to the spherical harmonic transform is that uh, we can use this spectral energy vector, which is uh, rotationally invariant. So the method will be robust, for example, if uh, uh, there is a database, there is a head in the database that is similar to the users, but due to the measurement procedure, it's rotated or non-aligned. If you haven't properly found the center, or if you misaligned the center somehow, is yeah. There a so, that as well? so translation is a problem. Uh, the the transform is not robust translation. Of course, that depends on how much translated it is. Uh, yeah, it seems like you cannot have uh, both. Uh, for example, you can use uh, normal three-dimensional FFT, and that would be kind of translation invariant if you take the energy, but it won't be rotationally invariant at all. Uh, while these transforms are rotationally uh, invariant, but uh, not translation invariant. Uh, for, for this problem, for example, on this study, uh, we, we did some rough alignment of the heads first by, using, uh, by detecting the entrances of the ears, so all the heads were pretty much aligned uh, to have the interoral axis uh, here, and the center was put uh, in the middle of, of the interoral axis. So all of them had kind of a common reference point, and um, we were hoping after that that uh, deviations would be small enough that uh, it would still capture similarities between two heads without uh, huge errors, for example. Uh, so uh, after we implemented the, the basic transforms, um, we wanted to apply them to the head scans and uh, we needed to perform a series of steps uh, to manage to do that, starting from a 3D mesh, coming from a laser scans. Uh, so the way we did that is that um, uh, we sampled the, uh, the head scans uh, by using first a ray tracer that uh, was shooting rays in uniform uh, uniformly arranged directions uh, all over uh, the 3D uh, sphere. And uh, then we could find the collision points from the ray tracer with the head mesh. And based on these collision points, we could determine, again, in a, in a grid of concentric spheres, we could determine uh, if points were inside the head or close to the boundary of the head and then use these sampled points uh, as uh, input to the transform. Uh, we used two, two cases of sampling. One was a solid sampling, so considering the head as a solid object, meaning that any point that, detect, that was detected as inside the head had a binary value of one, and all the other points had zero. And the second case uh, was considering the head as a shell with uh, some uh, w uh, width or, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, some width. Uh, meaning that uh, all, the all the points that they were uh, around uh, with some margin to the head shape uh, had a value of one and all the other points were zero. The difference between these two conditions was that uh, we didn't know from, we couldn't predict from the beginning which one would uh, perform the best. Uh, also, the cell sampling has the advantage that uh, it's more robust to any mess errors or irregularities like holes, so it wouldn't care about that, while for the solid sampling, we need to be sure that the mesh is closed to detect if the points are inside the head or outside. Are you going to talk more about your sampling rates, like how dense? Oh, uh, yeah, time? yeah. <clears throat> uh, we tried a few, a few things. Uh, so, in the beginning, I, I took very high sampling grids. Uh, so we had, um, yeah, and I can actually show you a bit here too. Uh, so we had uh, a number of rays that uh, were shoot shooting from the center and they were uniformly distributed. And these were around 15,000. And then we had concentric spheres that they were uh, at about one millimeter difference in radius. And uh, finally, I decided that uh, uh, we would like to keep this radial resolution, but uh, 
I re we reduced quite a lot the angular resolution by reducing the rays to around 5,000 without significant changes, uh, at least uh, not seen in this, uh, yeah, in this study we did. Uh, and uh, yeah, but uh, that was something that uh, we found important uh, also to optimize the, the transform because if you do just a direct naive implementation of it, it's uh, quite slow and uh, intensive, costly, both in memory and in processing. Uh, but um, uh, if, um, if we observe the fact that inside the transform there is a spherical harmonic transform which uh, becomes just a single summation, if you make sure that your rays are as much uniformly distributed on the sphere as possible, uh, so this integration becomes just a sum, uh, then you can have a, a huge speed up. And uh, also there were a few other optimizations, like uh, for all the spheres that they were completely inside the head, we could, uh, because the, um, all these samples had just the value of one or zero, if it was the solid condition or the cell condition, uh, we could also very quickly determine the, the coefficients of the transform. Uh, yeah. So, this is some, an example show of uh, how the algorithm was, um, uh, how the method was, uh, w what it was seeing basically. So that's, uh, uh, that's a head mess of uh, my scary mentor, uh, Mark. And uh, this is an example of uh, uh, the ray tracer collision points where here different colors model uh, how many times the ray has uh, exited the head and then it has entered the head again if, it's, if it hits, for example, the neck or the ear. Uh, and this is a case of the solid sampling. So here we have a very uh, coarse condition of uh, around 15 spheres, I think, only, uh, which captures just a very basic shape of the head. While here I think I had around um, 200 spheres and uh, we can see that it captures the head quite uh, well. And for the case of the cell sampling, so keeping only the points that are around the mesh, uh, this is a case of 5,000 points, and this is a case of uh, 15,000 points. Uh, again, that has to depend with uh, how much stuff you are trying to model. So in the beginning, uh, we were really trying to capture all the variations on the year two. But then on the way, we decided that it's probably better to separate the two things. First, try to capture uh, just the head shape, and then maybe try to capture separately the ear shape and use that somehow. Uh, so that allowed us to reduce the number of uh, sampling points quite a lot. And this is an example of uh, the, uh, how this head spectra look like. Uh, this is the case for the shot. This is the case for the fourier bessel transform. And uh, uh, these are the, the representations after we have um, computed these spectral energies. So these are these rotationally invariant uh, vectors that, uh, that we are actually using to compare similarities between the heads. And we can see that there, is, there are various periodicities this has to do with the way the, the basis functions are uh, indexed in the transform. Uh, and uh, basically what they mean is that every few coefficients, uh, it comes the coefficient that corresponds to a wave function that grows only uh, radially and it doesn't have any angular variation. And uh, these coefficients uh, integrate with the interior of the head, which is uh, solid and they have a quite high value, basically. While the coefficients that have uh, angular variation, they uh, get suppressed. Uh, so yeah, first by getting the uh, spectra, then we are computing this uh, energy spectra, uh, which uh, are also uh, reduced in length. And then to compute the similarity between the heads, we just take the uh, Euclidean distance between uh, this energy spectra, uh, uh, the Euclidean distance between these vectors for two different heads. And we have uh, a metric that determines somehow how closely they are in shape. So, 
before you go to the results, uh, I wanted to ask about these, why you've chosen to evaluate two separate transforms, the shot and the Fourier vessel one, because it, uh, are they both complete and orthogonal uh, basis function sets? Yeah, or, yeah. So then, theoretically, if you use it wouldn't matter. then it shouldn't matter, right? So one or the other. Are you going to be comparing them in terms of the length of coefficients you need, or is there one you would expect? Uh, coefficients there were a few yeah. results, and actually, they were uh, kind of uh, uh, the original motivation for that was dropped in the middle, in the midway. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the original idea was to go with a short transform. Um, it's uh, novel and it has some nice properties. Uh, and uh, one of them was that uh, you could have data uh, on a rectangular grid. And uh, there was a, a like perfectly defined transformation to go from this uh, to, to make the shot work on data on a rectangular grid without error. While uh, in the case of the Fourier Bessel transform, you would need interpolation of this uh, data on the rectangular grid to a spherical grid, which means that you would lose some information there. Uh, so in that case, we were going with a shot, but also trying the Fourier Bessel transform because uh, it's most commonly used in a way. Okay. Uh, but then we realized that since we can define the sampling grid we want ourselves and uh, in a way that can speed up the computations a lot, we used spherical sampling grids. So in that case it wouldn't matter anymore which one of the two. Uh, but then I decided to use both of them uh, mainly because of these different uh, boundary conditions. So the Fourier Bessel transform uh, is determined in a solid sphere without seeing anything outside of it. And that sounds perfect for a head shape, for example, since you can enclose it completely in a, in a sphere. While the shot, um, you have to consider kind of the size of the shape too to be sure that it's captured uh, enough. Um, uh, yeah, that the, the transform works basically. Uh, and that wasn't clear how it would, it would work. So we decided to keep both of them. Uh, and then in terms of implementation, at least uh, after you had um, uh, like the maths done right in some functions, uh, there was no difference in applying one or the other. Uh, yeah. And they were also comparable in terms of uh, speed quite much. So. That would be the other considerations if one of them is much faster. Yeah. Comparable. Yeah, it wasn't. Okay. It wasn't in this case at least. If uh, somebody looks much more in detail on them, maybe there are uh, stuff that can be optimized. Maybe the polynomials of one have some nicer formula to compute than the other. Uh, but it wasn't anything apparent, at least. Uh, so yeah, after uh, we, we managed to apply the transforms to the heads, we wanted to see if we get anything uh, reasonable out of these transforms. And uh, one way to do that was to try to reconstruct the heads back from the coefficients. And um, the, well, yeah, uh, since we could uh, define this uh, reconstruction in any kind of grid we wanted, this is an example of uh, trying to reconstruct the head in a horizontal plane passing through the ears. And uh, we can see that for both transforms, the head shape is captured quite well. So it has a clear boundary going from a value close to one uh, down to zero. And uh, uh, also here I have plotted directly the points that are coming from the ray tracer, the collision points with the mesh, the true mesh. And we can see that they are very well aligned along the boundary that the transform gives. And we can also see that uh, things like um, uh, the, the pinna lobe here is uh, also captured something, for example, that the spherical harmonic transform wouldn't be able to, to model. Uh, and then we could, we could also reconstruct the full head on a 3D, uh, 3D volumetric grid and get a 3D representation of it. So that's an example of the transform and how it performs going from a very low order representation. So using just a few coefficients, to a pretty high representation. And uh, we can see that it starts from like looking like a rough ball to something that uh, starts to get quite accurate with regards to the head. Uh, 
All right. Uh, finally, after after uh, this work on the transforms and the applications to the heads, uh, we wanted finally to see if it was any useful to the problem of uh, this HRTF matching. So, uh, using the head scan of a user, trying to detect the uh, closest head scan in the database, and then pulling the HRTF uh, and see if it would match that user at all. Uh, however, we did. We did we decided as a first step to check not the full HRTF, but the IDDs, uh, mainly for the reason that um, uh, the IDDs are uh, better understood in the way that we know that they depend mainly on the head shape and the head size, uh, while the HRTF magnitudes, uh, they, uh, they depend both on the head shape and size, but also quite strongly on the ear and uh, the ear shape. Uh, so the magnitude seemed that it needed some more work in order to separate it in a way that you would have head-related uh, features and uh, ear-related features. Uh, and uh, IDD anyway is one of the two major components of the HRTFs and uh, we thought that it would be a nice first step uh, for that. Uh, so the IDD basically models, uh, IDD means the rural time difference, and it models the time difference that it takes for a sound to propagate from the uh, one ear to the other, uh, coming from a certain uh, direction. Uh, it, um, uh, and uh, it looks something like that, if you plot it in uh, 3D space, measured for a single subject, uh, and that's in uh, uh, milliseconds, uh, I think. And uh, it's almost zero in the medial plane because there are no time differences between the two years and it gets its maximum on the complete like um, uh, extreme lateral directions on the left and the right. Uh, so, so what we do, we did to uh, apply the method and evaluate it uh, was uh, first to apply the transform to all the heads in the database, get the spectra for each head. Uh, then, since we also had the measured HRTFs for each head, we extracted uh, the ITDs for each, uh, for each uh, subject. Uh, we, we determined uh, a similarity between uh, directly the ITDs for all the subjects in the database uh, by taking the Euclidean distance uh, between IDDs for uh, all directions for each subject. And uh, having these, uh, um, these uh, two similarity metrics, one for the IDDs and one for the head spectra, we, we constructed a distance matrix first for the heads and then for the IDDs themselves. Uh, then we also used as baselines uh, two quite popular approaches to uh, using non-personalized HRTFs. Uh, one was to use an average IDD uh, from the whole database, and uh, the other was to use uh, an IDD measured from an uh, anthropomorphic uh, mannequin, uh, meaning that uh, um, you take uh, kind of a doll that uh, models kind of an average uh, person, and you put the microphones on each ear and you measure its HRTFs and then you use these HRTFs or IDDs for, um, uh, for the user. So these are the, the baseline conditions of average and uh, generic. The generic corresponds to the mannequin IDDs. And uh, for each subject, we also compared uh, the IDD distances between the subject's own IDDs and uh, the average and the generic ones. Uh, before I move to the results, uh, this is an example of uh, what this similarity, head similarity, uh, looks like. So, in this case, I plot uh, the, similar, the, the three most similar head for one, uh, for two original heads, and uh, we can see that even though it's very hard to say visually anything. Uh, about the transform itself. Uh, I think that it, it seems like it's getting something about the shape and the size of the heads, at least. 
Uh, so about the results, uh, this is a pretty confusing plot, but uh, what it shows basically is that uh, for each uh, subject in the database, uh, so yeah, I forgot to mention that we used 144 uh, subjects in the database. So for each subject in the database, uh, this plot shows the ITD difference between their own IDDs and uh, the IDDs that they were returned from our method, which is the head, the blue line. Uh, the, the IDD difference between the subject's own and the average IDD, and the same for the subject's own IDDs and the uh, mannequin, which is this uh, hat. Uh, also, the bottom line, the purple one, uh, shows uh, the ITD distance between uh, its subject and its uh, closest match in terms of ITD distance itself. So uh, if we take one subject, which other subject is closer, has the, has the least ITD difference to that subject, and uh, how much is that? And uh, we can see that uh, this line basically defines a lower uh, bound in performance in what we can get with our method. Because if we can select a person from the database randomly, we can never go below that line or by using any kind of uh, algorithm. And uh, for the rest of the lines, it's pretty hard to, to see what is going on. Uh, we can say that uh, the hats, the generic uh, uh, head, doesn't seem to not perform too well. It has the most variation, the yellow line, uh, while uh, the average and the head, they look pretty close. Uh, so in order to evaluate that a bit further, um, uh, we, we created some scores that they say basically for how many subjects uh, the method was performing better. So the blue line was lower than the average, than the orange line or the yellow, the generic IDD. Uh, and this, these scores were basically these. Uh, so what this says is that uh, for 64% of the subjects, the method based on the uh, short transform was performing better than the average ITD. And uh, for 71% of the subjects, it was performing better than the uh, generic uh, ITD. And uh, also the fourier bercet transform looks to be uh, quite close, but performs slightly worse. And uh, the spherical harmonic transform, uh, so we also included that for uh, comparison and evaluation. So just applying the more traditional approach of using the spherical harmonic transform to detect the similarity of the heads, uh, performs, performs significantly worse than uh, the full three-dimensional transforms, uh, which is a good motivation to keep looking at these transforms, um, uh, even though they require some extra work compared to the uh, simplest approach. Uh, one comment about the average and uh, ITD is that um, uh, there seems to be s uh, a high number of subjects here that the orange line is uh, pretty low. So it seems that there are uh, subjects inside the database that are very close to the average ITD. Uh, and actually, for some cases, the orange line goes even below the purple line, which means that uh, there is not a single subject in the whole database that has a closer ITD uh, to the user, to this specific user, than the average ITD. So it seems that um, uh, it would be advantageous to make some uh, preliminary uh, study on the ITDs or the HRDFs themselves to cluster somehow uh, the users inside them. And that can uh, probably give more information uh, for the matching problem. Uh, since it seems like there are subjects that are uh, uh, very average in a way, very close to the average uh, HRDF. But then there are also subjects that are very far from that. Uh, so they are highly individualized in a way. Uh, some comments on uh, future work uh, or potential uh, next uh, steps. Uh, so, of course, the ITD is one part of the HRTF. Uh, the, uh, the second part is the HRTF magnitudes. But as I mentioned, uh, this doesn't work directly because of the effect of the PINA. 
So one idea was that to apply this uh, uh, shape similarity on the ear shapes too. Uh, and in that way, we could end up with uh, two sets of uh, similarity of, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, spectra, one for the head and one for the ear. And then somehow use these uh, two similarities to pick up HRTF magnitudes from the database. Uh, however, that somehow requires some kind of factorization or decomposition of the HRTF magnitudes into head-related and pinna-related components. Uh, if there is a way to do that, then it also means that you can also probably pull up the head-related part from a, one subject and the pinna-related part from a different subject if the algorithm looks that this is uh, a good way to go, if the method shows that. Uh, finally, to conclude, uh, this was a study on uh, some 3D spherical transforms that they have not been used before in acoustics, and they seem to have interesting properties uh, with potential to uh, interpolation and registration uh, or a similarity finding or matching of uh, 3D data. Um, and uh, it looks to us, and we did some uh, preliminary steps to validate that, that they are suitable for some audio and acoustical applications, such as uh, 3D interpolation of near field HRTFs and HRTF personalization. And uh, we got some promising results on uh, personalization of HRTFs by application of. Uh, these transforms uh, on uh, head meshes and uh, on ITDs. And that should be it. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank uh, also especially uh, the guys in the team, uh, my mentor Mark Thomas, uh, Hannes, David, and Ivan that is not here today, and also the great interns that uh, they left already and they left me alone here, Matt Long and Supreet. I hope they will watch this presentation in the future, or probably not, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So one quick question, you, t you said you talked about, um, you had thought about using Connect or whatever to do the 3D head scans. Did you actually do much of that or did you just use the scans from the Head database that you already have. Uh, yeah, no, this study didn't didn't use this uh, lower kind of uh, quality scans. Uh, it was uh, based on uh, pretty high quality laser scans that uh, they were measured by the guys uh, here. Okay. Uh, so that would be a natural progression to check it with um, uh, lower resolution scans or scans of the same person but measured in different conditions, different setups, different methods maybe, maybe to generate the scan. And uh, uh, hopefully the method should be robust to that. So the same person measured with different setups and uh, yeah, uh, ways uh, after some alignment for this translation problem based on some very rough features, for example, uh, they should be detected as very similar compared to other heads, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, we haven't checked that yet. Okay. Can, can you give an idea of how long it would take to process one head? Say you have, say you have everything set up and then I scan somebody and... Well, for the resolution that uh, we used at least for um, these results, uh, that would be around a minute per head per transform. So the transforms were pretty much the same time. Uh, using the same sampling grid, it was about a minute uh, each. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and this was a pretty high resolution in a way that maybe one millimeter uh, for each sphere is not required. Uh, but this th these things need to be checked individually uh, with some simpler cases, not just throw a full head, head scan in and check what is going on, but uh, yeah. Because it's pretty easy to probably detect sampling conditions for the angular variation, but uh, at least to me it's not apparent to detect a sampling condition across the radial uh, dimension. Um, there is a squ like a radius squared on the integration there and some stuff that make it a bit more involved.
didn't mention the other motivation for using shot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, that was the main one. How could I forget it? Uh, yeah, so to return to your question about why using one or the other, shot sounded great because co you combine it with head blade transfer functions and you have headshot. <laughs> and that nails it down. <laughs> Sorry? No one online has asked any questions? Uh, I don't see anything here. Thanks, <laughs> 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 Thank you.